Penelope Spears, you are a legend, an icon, <laughs> rock and roll anthropologist, uh, so much more, trailblazer. Oh. Um, look, the, you started with these music videos, and, and here we are 30 years later, later talking about Wayne's World. It's quite an incredible writing journey you've been on. Um, I got to talk about Wayne's World. First of all, let me just say, uh, from my own personal experience, when you guys shot the first movie, uh, there was a, a little place on La Brea, La Brea and Fairview where my father used to, where my father lives. Mm -hmm. And you guys were shooting there with Ed O'Neill and I had a great experience visiting set and meeting Ed and yourself. Really? 30 years ago, yes. Uh, it, you incredible. must have been two years old. I was 10 at the time, but <laughs> it was actually my first uh, glimpse inside of like Hollywood. It was quite wow. amazing. Here oh, we are 30 cool. years. I know, wow. absolutely cool. And you're right, and you can help me because so many people uh, challenge me when I tell them that that's where Stan Makita's Donuts was, is with LA on La Brea. And they go, no, 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 it's in Aurora, Illinois. And I'm like, uh-uh, yeah, because you were there. Fairview wow. and La Brea, Fairview and La Brea. I know it very well. Uh, yeah. Now, my first question for you is, uh, there's a long history of comedic duos out there, Laurel and Hardy, Beavis and Butthead, and uh, Wayne and Garth in the 90s. Why do you think these duos seem to stand the test of time? Because mm. people need to laugh and they love to laugh. And um, when you get two comedians on stage or on camera and they have this magic chemistry, it's just unbeatable, you know? Right. And uh, I think people just gravitate toward it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, look, nostalgia has been been all the rage in the most recent years. Mm -hmm. There's all these revivals, Ghostbusters and every property that you can imagine seems like it's it's getting somewhat of a revival. Uh, why is it that you've resisted uh, a revival of Wayne's World? Oh, I never resisted it. Oh, okay. I think I think honestly, Joseph, uh, what happened was, you know, we did the first Wayne's World and it was a, a, a very big success. And then see, when they told me after we finished the movie that they were going to do uh, Wayne's World 2 so soon, I thought, gosh, that just seems a little quick to me. And um, then for various reasons, I wasn't involved, you know, right. but over the years, I get like scripts and synopsis and in storylines where people want to have a Wayne's World 3. Right. And, and I have to redirect them over to Paramount and go, They've got the intellectual property. Go to Paramount, see if you can get that movie made, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, look, do you think that Wayne's World uh, is a product of its time or do you think it could live in the modern comedy landscape? Well, it seems to be living in the modern comedy landscape because I'm talking to you, and, right? <laughs> right? And, and, and because Paramount is putting out this, um, I didn't even know what a steel box was. I feel like a dope. But did you know what a steel box was? I do. I have a few. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a collector oh. of these steel boxes. I dig them. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what is it you like about that? I'm interviewing you now, right? You know what? I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the physical media aspect, the actual yeah. collection. I like the display. I, 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 I don't want to say that I'm a cinephile because I feel like that, that would, I, I'm a fan of cinema. Okay. Uh, I, I, I less study it, but I'm a fan of it. And I, and I like the collection. I just like the displays. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, I guess a lot of people do. And they want to have those things they can hold in their hand rather than pressing a button on their phone. So I'm just thrilled that, you know, all these years later, 30 years later, that Paramount's doing this in, in, in keeping the movie alive, you know? Absolutely. And I personally will do until the day I die, um, whatever I can to keep Wayne's World and the decline and suburbia, especially alive, you know? 100%, 100%. Now, I have a, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, upon my research, you shot Wayne's World in 37 and a half days, is that correct? Well, you know, everybody refers to it as 34, but you have a secret, which is, we sent a second unit crew to Aurora, Illinois, so that we could pick up some you know, uh, shots that made it look like we really shot it there. Right. And I stayed home, uh, in the editing room and they had a second uh, unit director and we got these extras and dressed them up as Wayne and Garth and made just really wide shots. So you couldn't tell it was, was them. Right. And I haven't told anybody else this. I'm giving you my secrets, Joseph. <laughs> Exclusive. 
I know, I was excluded here 30 years later. Um, but um, that's why there was those extra days on there. But most people refer to it as a 34 day shoot because they don't know about those two extra days. Gotcha, yeah. look at that, breaking news on on, on a I'm, I'm on telling Wayne's you, man, world. you figured it out. Crazy. You busted now, us. <laughs> now, now, out of those 34 days, what was the biggest challenge uh, during your shoot? I'm going to say the biggest challenge during the shoot was making everybody happy because um, everybody was trying so hard. It wasn't like they were being, you know, obnoxious or intrusive about it. It was just that they really wanted to do a good job. And, 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 you know, Mike and Dana knew they, if they were going to continue making movies, they better make this one work. So everybody right. was trying really, really hard. And the writers were trying really, really hard. And the studio, everybody was, you know. And so um, luckily I'm a oldest child of four kids and I was always placed in charge of all the kids. So on the set, I was in charge of all the kids and I had to kind of settle the arguments and, uh, <laughs> and di diplomatically without making anybody mad, uh, try to find something that would you know work for everybody. Cause I mean, I was getting suggestions tucked in my back pocket without me knowing it you know right right yeah. i can only imagine i can only oh, imagine yeah. now while while snl is still uh you know making stars yearly why do you think uh snl hasn't been able to crack the iconic character uh that penetrates pop culture like in years past like wayne's world i think it's because of the characters of wayne and garth i mean if you look at the other films that they've done um they don't they don't really have that kind of um, emotional uh, sympathetic connection that Wayne right. and Garth do. And, and, you know, Coneheads, I don't feel emotional about Coneheads. I'm sorry. I'm with <laughs> you. I, actually, I am with you on this. I, I'm uh -huh. with you on this. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have an emotional connection, you know? And uh, so I, I think that's the difference. And uh, I was just, fortunate to to be a part of that and um you know help push it along you know absolutely now are you aware that it's been reported that queen's freddie mercury actually uh saw the bohemian rhapsody headbanging scene before he passed away and did you do you know if there's any truth to that uh at all well i'm gonna tell you this is another exclusive joseph okay because <laughs> i've heard this before and my guess is it's not true. Oh, um, okay. My guess is it's not true. I mean, I think the only person who really, really knows is Brian May, and we might be able to ask him. But if I look at the time frame between when Freddie passed away, when I finished the film, it's really hard to believe that somebody had access to a VHS and brought it and showed it to him. And besides that, he was very, very, very sick. Right. I went to a, um, unfortunately, I went to um, a party that MCA was giving over on the ship, the Queen, right. uh, the Queen Mary, and um, everybody was there except Freddie. And so, yeah, he was sick. So I, I'm going to have to say, somebody's going to have to prove it to me right. that there, there was uh, that, some, that, but you know, it's a weird thing. Somebody can make that up because who's going to say yes or no? Yeah, it's, it's one of these legends that are just going to kind of maybe yeah. just live on. Yeah, well, maybe, but I'm going to have to have it proven for, right. for to me. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of another uh, iconic rock star, uh, we just lost Meatloaf. Can you share any uh, memories of Meatloaf uh, and working with him in this film? Well, I share more memories of Meatloaf of oh. hanging out in in, a cl in the clubs with him, you know, on the strip in the 80s. Uh, and we were all, you know, just drunk buddies back then. <laughs> How can I tell you, you know? Uh, and uh, yeah, he would always wear a long trench coat. And I don't remember what he's wearing in the movie, but probably a trench coat. Uh, and uh, we, would, we would hang out at the Rainbow and the Roxy and the Whiskey. And so I knew him from there. And that's, that's, that's why I, I asked him to do the movie is because I was friends with him. You know, you are a legitimately a trailblazer and trendsetter in Hollywood. And, and I honestly do respect you tremendously for this. I mean, 
the couple of things that I found that I found out uh, upon research. One of them is that uh, you your, your agent negotiated uh, significant residuals, um, which I'm sure you're probably still getting to this day, um, and uh, that 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 got you involved with the DGA. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement with the DGA and why that was so important to you after Wayne's World? Well, honestly, I mean, Wayne's World was my seventh movie. And before that, I, I didn't have the protections of, of the Director's Guild. And for example, I was working on a low budget piece of crap movie named uh, Hollywood X Kind. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the producer was in the other room and I hear somebody go, action. And I'm like, wait a minute, man, you can't do that. I'm the director. You can't go be shooting another, sh another scene. Right. But if I was in the director's guild at that point, all I do is call them up and say, you got some psycho producer down here trying to direct, you know? But I really was so appreciative of, of getting into the, to the director's guild, not only for that, but also for the residuals, you know? I mean, all the six movies I did, before Wayne's World, I don't have any residuals from those, you know? And um, anyway, so uh, getting into the DGA, getting into the studio system and having Bob Ramey, who I think was a was uh, the president of the Academy at the time, walk up to me on the Paramount lot and go, how would you like to be in the Academy of Motion Pictures, Penelope? And I thought, dude, do you know who you're talking to? I'm some, I'm some chick from a trailer park, you know? It's like, uh, yeah, I want to be in the Academy. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, look, you're really good at capturing uh, the human story. I mean, just like your documentary, The Decline of Western Civilization, it really captures the human story and the punk rock scene. And then in the second one, in the metal scene. Um, Capturing the human story, just talking about that for a second, you've worked with so many legendary comedians, Richard Pryor, Danny DeVito, you've worked with them all, um, yeah. and you've captured their human spirit and their human story, and uh, like I said before, you're a rock and roll anthropologist, but you're really good at understanding the subject matters, which are the, the people. Um, can you talk to me, this is a long way of asking, can you talk to me about uh, Mike Myers and working with Mike and the human story of him being a comedian and because I know that some of the times it wasn't the easiest working with him, especially in that era. So can you just talk about that experience a little bit? Well, I mean, we all have our backstory. We all have our little quirks and tweaks, you know what I mean? So right. Mike is back then uh, was very kind of fragile and extra, extra careful and ne never wanted to make a mistake when we were shooting. You know, wanted everything to be, just right and so it was like honestly it was a little bit like walking on eggshells you know dealing with him because I didn't want to say the wrong thing or you know set him off or anything Dana was a little easier because he's not he doesn't have that vibe like right. oh man don't mess with me you know but 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 Mike was but it was only because he was trying to do a good job you know what I mean and there is a lot of talk about how we didn't get along on set but honestly it, it there was only one time I remember that we had a disagreement and it was because I was trying to shoot. And it was at, it was at, um, it was at Stan Makita's and um, he didn't have any um, uh, margarine for his bagel and he's hypoglycemic. So you don't want to get him in a bad mood, you know, because if you don't have your, your blood sugar up, you kind of get grumpy. Okay. Right. So I understand that. Uh, he can't help it, whatever. Anyway, so I'm like waiting and trying to get some margarine, you know? <laughs> uh, but I mean, what a silly little thing. That was not a big deal. It doesn't mean that we didn't get along on the set. You know, I mean, when the movie was over and I didn't get to direct Wayne's World 2, um, yeah, I was uh, uh, really devastated, to be honest with you. Justifiably. Yeah, and... Um, but I look at it like a really beautiful uh, life lesson that uh, made me stronger in that I can get over rejection. I can get over that and, and, not, and not care about it. You know, I'm like, okay, you don't want me, bye, goodbye. I can look, just do that. 
I have my last question for you. Look, I, I am a huge fan of the decline of Western civilization. I think it is amazing. Um, I've heard you in the past talk about uh, Frederick Weissman is one of your favorite documentarians. Right. Um, yep, yep. What, what is it about his style that attracts you? Okay, brilliant question. Thank you. And I wish documentarians that are making movies today would look at that. And, and it is that Frederick Weissman would set up a camera and be totally objective and let you see what was going on without imposing his own uh, thoughts and standards about it. And that's, that's what I loved about his work. Um, I wanted, and when I do my docs, I, I, I want to be objective. I want to say, look, you got some punk rockers that are pain in the ass. They're gnarly. They're, you know, nasty, whatever you judge. I'm not going to tell you they're great. I'm not going to tell you they're not great. But, you know, somebody like Michael Moore, for example, he's jamming it down your throat about, why don't you believe what I believe? You know, sure. so that that's, I mean, I'm sorry to put somebody down, but uh, that's the deal. Well, look, Penelope, you are an incredible filmmaker. Like I said, trailblazer legend. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Honestly, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Joseph. Take care. Take care.